I'm not a hypnotist, and I promise I'm not going to try to steal your wallets. But I am going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to count to five, and then I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. Ready? It's okay, you can trust me. Deep breath. Close your eyes. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Let me tell you what's changed in the five seconds that your eyes were closed. 14 million emails were sent. 60 new cars came off production line. 25 babies were born and Starbucks sold 230 cups of coffee. <laughs> it's pretty interesting what can change over the course of only five seconds. Well, in those same five seconds, women and children in South Africa walked a collective 442 miles to get clean water for their families. And by the end of the day, they will have walked far enough to make 16 round trips to the moon. Access to clean drinking water is a serious problem that we're faced with today. A basic human right denied to them by poor infrastructure and lack of development. There are currently 1.1 billion people worldwide that do not have access to clean water, and 2.6 billion that don't have access to basic sanitation. Did you know that over the course of this year, 3.4 million people are going to die due to water-related illnesses? And for those of you that are from this area, to put that in perspective, that is the rough equivalent population of Los Angeles. Now, honestly, I don't really expect anyone here to relate to those astronomically massive figures. They're simply statistics, and the overuse of statistics like those has really lost its dramatic effect over the years. But I do believe that we are a visually stimulated species. This is a water pump in Yunnan province, southern China. Yunnan province has been suffering from drought for five consecutive years, and there are many communities inside Yufan Pro uh, Yunnan province, forgive me, that currently do not have access to clean water. As sad as the father and son look in this photo, they are exponentially more fortunate than most to live in close proximity to this water pump. Here we have a group of women and children who have gathered in the center of town for the usual delivery of water by truck. And here we have them filling up their buckets. And here. Here is the truck filling up on its reserves of water in order to make delivery later that day to that same group of women and children that we had seen in the previous slide. Now they're going to use that water to wash their vegetables, to clean their dishes, to wash their clothes and to bathe themselves, and it all needs to be reused. Some of these women have walked between 10 and 15 miles just to get here, and they're gonna have to walk that same distance to get home now with a new heavy load on their shoulders. When's the last time any of us had to walk 30 miles, especially to get something as basic as water, which is so necessary for survival. So what am I here to tell you about today? With the help of several fellow students, we have designed a device that we feel may very well help to curve some of these staggering numbers and lend aid to the faces we've seen in these photos. Our device is called the Revaporator. A low-cost device capable of being built almost entirely with items that you can find in your local hardware store, the Revaporator is designed to harness and utilize the water process, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, to achieve mechanical energy. By artificially establishing a closed circuit, low pressure system within the device, the Revaporator uses curved heliostats, or mirrors, to redirect solar energy into the heat concentrating portion at the bottom of the device. And then with the help of virtual perpetual motion fans, it is able to achieve mechanical energy by expediting the water process. Now, the conception of the evaporator was somewhat accidental, but in hindsight, very fortuitous. Or rather, it's more appropriate to say that the application of the device was accidentally stumbled upon, somewhat like Teflon or penicillin. It all started with a personal challenge to myself. I wanted to see if I could conceptually design a perpetual motion machine. And naturally, I decided to base it on one of the planet Earth's most basic processes, the water process. The first materialization of this little idea was a drawing I had scribbled in my economics notebook. The idea first dawned on me when I was in the middle of my class. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> but this little idea soon snowballed. And as I showed it to more and more people, my fellow students got increasingly involved. We began tweaking it and improving it. And as the design improved, the application of a device capable of maintaining such a high level of motion 
day in and day out became seemingly apparent. Energy production. And hence, we had set out with the humble and noble goal of saving the planet and bringing free, clean energy to people everywhere. <laughs> and you know what? Our goal started changing. Our main team was comprised of myself, a student from China, a student from India, and a student from Jordan. And we had been working on the design for a submission for an international clean technology challenge. And we were all sitting there and we're thinking, we're looking at our device, trying to change this and that. And then it hit us. If this is a self-sustaining device that runs on water, what if it could filter its own water? And better yet, what if it could filter and pump its own water? And that was our accident, our penicillin, a self-powered water pump and filtration system. And since the water is evaporated, cooled, and then recirculated, the device, in our opinion, had aptly earned the title, the re-evaporator. Now, why us? Why did we decide to tackle such a massive problem? Well, honestly, we didn't really intend on it. It kind of happened spontaneously. The first one in our group to bring up the problem was my teammate and good friend, Harsh Verma, from Rajasthan, India. And he had mentioned that access to clean water is a serious problem in his country. And we started thinking about it. And we realized that that's a serious problem in all of our countries. Now, with the revaporator, I want to stress this really quickly. I apologize. This is where I start to get into my really heavy stuff. The photos that you've seen before were given to us by my teammate and good friend, Yufan Yang. Now, he's up there, I think, in one of those booths. He's working at, at the... Uh, TEDx today, and I had asked him for some photos for the presentation today. So he got in touch with his mom, and the very next day, his mom began sending us all of these photos. She had told the people in her community that we were working on our design and that we wanted to bring it to all of you here today. The community started sending photo upon photo upon photo. We really didn't need to try at all to get these. And the thing that's really interesting is that this isn't happening in some faraway place. All those pictures are from my friend's hometown province. That's his backyard. And from my friend Hirsch from India. And my friend Amer from Jordan. This is our backyard, and we need to do something about it. Now, there are several aspects to our device that make it unique and worthy of being presented to you here today. Now, be warned, my dear, dear audience, this is going to be my 30 seconds of technical babble. So to avoid bleeding from the ears, those of you who are not engineers or super nerds like myself who enjoy reading literature on why E equals MC squared and turbocharger applications, feel free to just kind of space out and enjoy the diagrams. <laughs> I also must stress that we opted to make our diagrams as simple and basic as possible in order to showcase and highlight our design's main features. Here we have a basic rendering of the outside view of the device. Let's cut into it and look at some of the more specific design features. The first is the design's thermodynamically conscious design. By orienting our fans, which are our main drivers, at slight angles throughout the tower's double helix system, we are able to ensure that the fans are placed to be as conducive to thermal airflow as possible. Second is the artificial establishment of a vacuum-like low pressure system within the device to help initiate evaporation and maintain constant motion of evaporation flow. The device then redirects solar energy with the band of mirrors into the heat concentrating portion at the bottom of the device. The evaporated water and heated air gain momentum as they rise towards the top exhaust port. The water then returns to the bottom cooling tank underground and the cooled air re-enters the evaporation chamber via that little hose right there. The third is our fan rotor housing design. I know it's a mouthful. Um, with the positioning of permanent magnets, we are able to achieve improved efficiency in fan momentum. By shielding each of the magnets with a primarily nickel-based substance, what we're able to do is manipulate the magnets and essentially create directional magnets. And then by placing them in a specified firing order around the fan, similar to that of a, an internal combustion engine in a car, we're able to ensure that no two magnets fight each other providing counter-rotational momentum. Our technology is 100% clean, using the world's most abundant resource, water, as an operating medium as well as final deliverable product. 
It has the potential to establish or improve water infrastructure for various water usage needs, including drinking water, plumbing, and sanitation. The benefits with proper development could be exponential. Now, is that to say that the revaporator is the only way of solving this problem, a proverbial silver bullet? Of course not. It would be naive to think that it would, but it would be equally ignorant to think that this problem is going to solve itself. There are other teams out there working with new developing technologies to also achieve this goal. And what we need now is cohesion, cooperation, strategies, and implementing partners. In our opinion, there is no 100% cure-all from a technological point of view. The only way to really solve this problem is to spread awareness, be involved, and tackle the problem head on. Now, by the time I finish this presentation, 70 more people will have died from waterborne illnesses. I say it's time for us to open our eyes to this problem, open our hearts, and make a difference in this world that we all can see. Thank you. Thank you.